It is Monday, November 16th, 2020. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the city's website. As well, a reminder that electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Members are reminded of the five minute, minute time limit, which will be adhered to during this meeting. Members can submit another request to speak if they require more time to ask questions or make comments. Now we'll go through roll call in alphabetical order. Councillor Collins. Seeing Councillor Collins. Councillor Farr. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, I'm present, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Ward six has joined you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Marula. President, sir. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Good afternoon, President. Thanks. Councillor Pauls. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pearson. I'm here. Councillor Vanderbeek. Here. Oh, sorry about thank that. You. I'm here. Yes, thank you. Thanks. And Councillor Whitehead. I'm not seeing Councillor Whitehead this afternoon. Okay. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to this afternoon's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, there are two changes to the agenda. We have two added communication items. Item 4.1, which is correspondence from Hamilton Bikeshare Incorporated, respecting item 8.2. The recommendation is that it be received and referred to the consideration of that item and added item 4.2, which is correspondence from Joanna Chapman respecting item 9.1. And the recommendation is, is that it also be received and referred to the consideration of that item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I need a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All in favor, all opposed. I don't think we got the fastest votes, the best votes, huge votes. The that hugest. Carries, yeah. The <laughs> hugest votes. Thank you. <laughs> On to declarations. Are there any declarations from members? Not seeing any. Councillor Jackson, I can, uh, <laughs> you're not muted. Thank you. Uh, on to approvals of the minutes of the previous meeting. This is for October 19th of 2020, as we missed uh, the last meeting, it was canceled. So I need a mover and a seconder to approve the minutes from October 19th, moved by Councillor Paul, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. On to communications. Item 4.1 is correspondence from Hamilton Bike Share Inc. respecting item 8.2, the public bike share program phase procure procurement process. And the recommendation is that it be received and referred to consideration of item 8.2. Need a mover and a seconder to refer and receive, and if there's any discussion. So moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Farr, and Councillor Nan. No discussion? Okay. So we need an electronic vote. Thank you, that carries unanimously. Item 4.2 is correspondence from Joanna Chapman. Respecting item 9.1, the road safety review and appropriate measures at the York Road and Newman Road intersection. And the recommendation is that this be received and referred to the consideration of 9.2. So we need a mover and a seconder to receive and refer, and then uh, if there's any discussion. So moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Jackson. Any discussion? Not seeing any. All in favor? We 
go. Count carries unanimous to consent items. Item six, I need a mover and a seconder to receive consent items 6.1 and uh, 6.2, and then uh, we'll open up for discussion. Mover and a seconder, moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? You, that carries unanimously. On to uh, item eight, staff presentation. So we have first up the solid waste management master plan, five year review. I'd like to call upon Angela Story, manager of business programs to present. All right, hi everyone, can you hear me okay? I can, yes, thank okay. you. Great. Uh, thanks very much. So as everybody knows, my name is Angela Story, and I am the manager of business programs. I work in the environmental services division of public works. And one of the roles that I support is the planning and education for the waste management programs. I'm here today to provide you with a 2020 update on the solid waste management master plan. The original solid waste management master plan was created and approved in 2001. The original plan had two guiding principles, 19 action items, and a diversion rate target of 65% by 2008. This was in line with the expanded Blue Box program at the time, the introduction of curbside yard waste collection, and rolling out a green cart collection program in 2006. In 2012, the master plan was reviewed and updated. The updated plan included 11 action items and the revised guiding principles to include that the city must lead and encourage changes necessary to achieve maximum waste reduction, that the Glanbrook landfill is a valuable resource, and as such, the city must minimize its residual waste and maximize the use of our diversion and disposal facilities, and the city must be responsible for the residual waste generated within its boundaries, and municipal partnerships could be considered. You'll recall for a number of years, prior to the shutdown of the CCF in 2018, we processed organics from Halton Region and the County of Simcoe. The 2012 master plan maintained a diversion rate target of 65% at the time. In 2012 though, our actual diversion rate was, 50, uh, was 43%. Due to the uncertainty in today's waste industry, you'll see that the 2020 update has prioritized action items to focus on the next five years. In 2020, staff worked with SNC Lavalin to develop the master plan to make it current given the many unknowns in the waste industry today. To do this, a review was undertaken, which included public consultation, a review of municipal best practices, and evaluation by waste management program staff to confirm any potential action items. From January 6th to February 7th, we received 3,778 online survey responses. SNC Lavalin hosted three focus groups with participants from single family homes, multi residential apartment buildings, and businesses. The online survey consisted of 88 questions and took an average of 16 minutes to complete. Survey results confirmed that residents and business owners place a high importance on information, education, enforcement, and incentivization. They want to know why we do things, not just how. And a common response from all groups was that they would be able to participate more fully in our diversion programs if they were more accessible in apartment buildings and if more materials could be recycled. The master plan update consisted a review of what actions other municipalities have included in their master plans, as well as reviewing what they've done to engage and educate their residents on waste programs and what industry best practices they've implemented using waste technologies. You'll see here that SNC reviewed municipalities both in and outside of Ontario. In order for staff to finalize the list of action items for the next five years, staff needed to evaluate the options to consider upcoming changes to the Blue Box program, the result of the CCF, RFP, and any active projects that, we already, that we're already engaged in to support the master plan. If a possible action item met the criteria above, 
it was not duplicated on the 2020 list of new projects. Projects currently underway by staff include an update of waste design requirements for new developments, ongoing improvements to the multi-res program, citing a location for a fourth transfer station and community recycling center on the West Mountain, ongoing development of stage four at the landfill, and continuing to monitor the blue box transition regulation. As noted at the beginning, this update focuses on programs to be completed in the next five years to best position Hamilton to adapt to the upcoming changes in the waste industry. The focus resulted in the 2012 guiding principles being unchanged. The diversion rate of 65%, although a big ask, remained the same. Action items will focus on reviewing policies, improving current programs, and gathering information for the future. 2025 marks the end of the 2001 master plan, as well as the end of the blue box transition. So it will be a good time to create an all new master plan in 2026. You'll see in this comprehensive list, the action items to be completed between 2021 and 2025. All items are on the list were items that were put forward from either the online survey and focus groups, a municipal scan, or the staff consultation. I'll provide a little detail for some of the items that may not be self-explanatory. The first one you see there is developing new waste performance metrics and related policies. With the pending legislation to transition the responsibility of the Blue Box program to producers, we will need to establish new measurements to track the status and performance of our waste management program. The city will also need to establish new targets to define what success is. Under supporting community reduce and reuse programs, staff are proposing to create and enact a policy that will provide greater support for these programs led by the community groups and nonprofit organizations. The third item is updating waste audit methodology so that audits being completed are more in line with the goals of the master plan and to provide more usable and reliable data by auditing more frequently and larger sample sizes. Item number four is improving existing programs such as business recognition, diversion at special events, and taking our school education program online. Item number five says reviewing the trash tag program. This is not to change the program, but to review the historical data since the program's launch in 2013. To analyze the number of trash tags seen at the curb on collection day and how many households currently request the additional trash tag allotment mailed each year. If a change to the program was recommended, information would be brought back to committee for review prior to making any changes. Number six is looking at the management of construction and demolition waste. A feasibility study would look at how more construction and demolition materials could be included in diversion rates and less material being disposed of at the Glanbrook landfill. The feasibility study will also review potential partnerships with commercial operators. Number seven is carrying out feasibility studies related to the development options for the MRF and the CCF should processing no longer be completed at our facilities. This would be as a result of the Transition Blue Box program and pending results of the CCF RFP. Developing intermunicipal policies and investigating intermunicipal partnerships would allow staff to investigate and potentially pursue partnerships with other municipalities that support our master plan's guiding principles. The policy would need to be created that sets the parameters for such partnerships that could result in financial and environmental benefits to Hamilton. Number nine, we'll ensure that we are prepared for the next waste collection contract in 2028. A council approved waste collection contract will be in place in 2021 and will remain in effect until 2028. Although 2028 is after the planning period of this master plan update, to include any major changes to the way waste is collected, investigation and approvals of new collection methods must happen with enough lead time to incorporate any changes in the waste collection contract. An example could be the use of carts for waste collection from single family homes. And number 10 is increasing curbside enforcement capabilities. 
This will have staff looking at the feasibility of different enforcement options to reject garbage set out at the curb based on what is included in the container. An example in other municipalities of an effective method to enforce the contents of the garbage stream could be to require material be set out in clear bags. Staff will also investigate the standardization of curbside monitoring between city and contracted collection staff. This could be done through auditing as well as education and training. And the final action item there is exploring green procurement options. Staff will contribute to the development of internal policies that support the recognition of what, uh, what qualifies as a green product and recommend preference be given to those products. This may be coupled with the implementation of the single use plastic strategy. As you can see here, all action items related to updated policies, doing feasibility studies and implementing any new programs will all be completed within existing oper operating and capital budgets. If after review, any items result in a recommendation to implement a program that would qu require additional funding or resources, such as the example given previously regarding using carts and automated collection trucks for garbage pickup, would be presented to Waste Management Advisory Committee, Public Works Committee, and Council for approval. So that concludes the update presentation, and Craig and I are both here if uh, you have any questions that you'd like us to answer. There we go. And Angela, would you just mind closing your presentation? Yeah, of course. I have Councillor Collins followed by Councillor Ferguson and Jackson. Councillor Collins. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and a very comprehensive uh, presentation by Angela for cert. So thanks, Angela, for all that information. There's a lot to digest there. As it Sorry, relates just, to the can I just cut you off for a second there? Councillor Pauls, um, your video is giving us a strobe light show here. At least it is on my end. Okay. Would you mind just trying to turn your video off and on? Oh. Thanks. Go ahead, Councillor Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick question. I'm looking at the uh, action items that are on the list, and uh, there's a long list there for certain in terms of items that we've discussed in the past as part of the master planning process. And one thing that has come about most recently is the investment that the province has made on Centennial Parkway with the new GO station. And I, I don't know, if for those of you who haven't um, visited the Kenora transfer station, it's the neighbor of the new um, GO station. And so those two properties are directly beside each other. And of course, if you look across the province at uh, GO stations, whether they be in the Toronto area or elsewhere, Almost every municipality has utilized those lands around the GO station for um, higher land use um, um, reasons, specifically related to investment. So whether it's commercial or residential, uh, you know, look no further than Burlington to see how close people want to see residential investments as it relates to GO station investments. And so um, I had managed through the centennial planning process to ask staff to investigate the relocation of the Kenora transfer station. I understand it's in a great uh, place right now as it relates to its proximity to the Glenbrook landfill and uh, the ability to get up uh, Centennial or up the uh, parkway to our landfill. And so there's some great synergies there, but I, I know there's a number of opportunities that may exist in the vicinity of Kenora uh, in that industrial area north of Barton there. So I. I didn't see it on the, the action items, and I want to make sure that we're not losing sight of, of investigating opportunities to relocate that transfer station to ensure that we're maximizing the investment that the province has made in the GO station on Centennial. So if I could just get some comment on that, I would appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. For sure. So through the chair, um, Councillor Collins, you and I have had this uh, small conversation before. And so Craig has done some peeking into what the status of that is, and he'll be able to answer your question today. Terrific. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Collins, I'm not aware of what the planning um, committee request that you've made has resulted in. We haven't had any conversations with them. Uh, you are right that 
this is not an action in the solid waste management master plan, but this was something that we would have to consider outside of that process. However, I have checked with staff and if this is, uh, if you want to give direction to us, we can use WIPs so that we can procure a, the services of a consultant to look at the feasibility of us moving that location, how much land we need, what the cost would be, things like that. Um, if we get that direction, then we'll reallocate those monies and then create a new um, capital detail sheet and get that work started. Okay. Thanks for that. I, I don't want to do anything on the fly today. I know it's documented already as part of the centennial process. And if memory serves me right, it was to be initiated when we look at our industrial land supply. Um, we could only take that out of circulation or convert, I think, the zoning on it uh, through that process. And so what I'll do is I'll check in with planning. I'll get something, Mr. Chairman, in writing from them in terms of explaining how that process works. And then I can work with Craig and Angela to come back with a motion to the committee here for uh, committee's consideration at a future date. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Angela. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was interesting getting an update on this. I'm glad to see you're not going to be making any wholesale changes to waste because it's always a very sensitive issue uh, to the consumer. But two questions. First of all, I had a neighbor recently move in across from me and they get to strut out every Wednesday morning with their recycle in a gold box. And my first reaction, which I think would be the reaction of a, a lot of people, hey, I want one of those. Have we abandoned the gold box uh, process to try to encourage people to recycle? Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, to Councillor Ferguson, we have not abandoned it. And you are actually saying exactly what we want you to say. Uh, when people see other folks move into neighborhoods or people see when they're driving through neighborhoods that they might not live in, when they see a gold box, we want them to want one. So that's great. Um, what we do every year is we uh, aim to provide 100 gold boxes in each ward. So that allows us to increase our gold box presence out in the city uh, by 1,200 gold boxes. The win rate of a gold box right now is around 40%. So we have to do at least twice as many audits uh, to award the gold boxes each year. So uh, anybody that does want to, we have a mygoldbox.ca website if they want to uh, get their address in for, for audit at an upcoming season. So we do audit uh, during daylight savings time. Uh, so usually between April and October. Okay, um, is that included in the waste pamphlet that comes out every spring with the, with the extra tags? There's information in the gold box program for sure in the, in the calendar, yes. Okay, thank you for that update. And secondly, is there any plans in the long term uh, to put another transfer station in the west end of the city? Right now, in my community, if, if you want to go transfer station, you have to go all the way across to Upper Ottawa Street or you have to go down to Dundas. Is there any plans for just one to the west end of the city or is that um, not on the uh, horizon? Yeah, so through the chair, it's not on the 11 action items that you saw there. It was on an earlier slide related to items that are already in the works. So Catherine McCausland, the manager of recycling and waste disposal, they're currently citing with real estate a location on the West Mountain for the fourth transfer station. Oh, good. Do you, do you know approximately where that, can you talk about where the shortlisted site is? Uh, so through the chair, I don't, I don't think we have a location yet, but I have always heard, you know, kind of near McNabb, uh, the, you know, McNabb High School, McNabb Rec Center is kind of like one of those nice central or sorry, West Mountain locations that would be ideal. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Chairman Danko, and uh, appreciate the presentation, Manager Story, and thanks for the advanced uh, time together to allow some additional Q&As and better understanding for me of this presentation. Uh, I really appreciate, Manager Story, the proactive manner of, uh, of which you uh, provided um, advanced information and knowledge. Um, some of us who have been here since amalgamation supported the original waste uh, solid waste management uh, master plan, Mr. Chairman, in 2001, not realizing there were a few dozen items in there that at some point in time may come back to haunt some of us down the road. And we were handcuffed down the road without 
providing any debate or different direction because, well, after all, Councillor Jackson, you supported the 2001 Solid Waste Management Master Plan and all these 32 items. So I really appreciate Manager Story's proactiveness in getting out front of this and alerting us to the fact that these are all, if you will, um, studies and pursuits uh, without any obligation at this time, if I've interpreted correctly, that she's, uh, she and her team are going to go for. A uh, couple of quick questions to her. Reviewing the, ta the trash tag program, uh, Manager Story, I was, um, I was a big supporter of this a few years back. I think we give out 14 initially and people can ask for an additional 12. Can you tell me if the numbers gone up using the trash tag, Mr. Chairman, especially during these eight months of the awful pandem pandemic? Through you? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chairman, to Councillor Jackson, uh, we have a KPI or a measurement target to send out less than 10,000 packages of the additional 12 trash tags every year. And since 2013, we have remained under or right on that 10,000 of 170,000 170, properties that we could mail to, okay. but we remained at that 10,000 marker lower. For this year, and yes, related to uh, folks being home, we think, um, doing a lot of garage clean, clean outs and stuff like that, we are a couple of thousand over already in, in 2020. So we have already had to reorder uh, some of our trash tags in order to meet that demand. So yes, we are seeing this year that more people are using their additional uh, trash tags. Well, thanks, Manager Story. And Mr. Chairman, I'm glad that it has remained a free complimentary service, especially in light of the financial hardship, Chairman Danko, as you know, many of our constituents and families are going through during the pandemic. So by luck or design, I'm glad we kept it as a complimentary program. I see uh, just a supplementary manager story on the tags. I see uh, on page 11 of Appendix A, you say the changes could, may hypothetically include sale, decreasing the number. Again, for my constituents listening in at this moment in time, it's the status quo on the trash tags, correct? Through you, uh, Chairman Danko. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. It's absolutely status quo at this point. This action item is to review the status and see, um, you know, how it's going, what's happening, um, et cetera. And if we wanted to recommend a change, it would come back through Waste Management Advisory Committee, Public Works Committee, and Council to get that approval. Thank you. And Chairman Danko, I just quickly have one more question. If uh, you indulge me, please, on item six uh, from page eight, investigating the management of construction and demolition waste. Am I interpreting that manager story to be that you don't feel the corporation has received enough credit for diverting construction and demolition waste and you'd like that to be included so that it would elevate the numbers of diversion rate with the city of Hamilton or have I misunderstood that? Through you, Chairman Danko, and that's my last question. Great, through the chair, uh, Councillor uh, Jackson. So it's not that we're, you know, not not having success in something. We accept a lot of construction and demolition debris as garbage. So A, people have to pay for getting rid of that waste and B, we have to send it to the landfill. So what we would like to do in this action item is to pursue some partnerships with other uh, agencies. It could be, you know, other transfer stations in the city, et cetera, who would accept it and we could consider it diverted instead of garbage so it wouldn't end up in our landfill instead it uh it would go you know drywall or the shingles or any of those other items they could be considered divertible products and not just sent to landfill thank you manager story chairman danko manager keep up the great work thank you mr chairman thank you councillor councillor pauls Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering through the chair, Angela, what does um, automatic carts, what are they? Thank you. Through the chair, Councillor Pauls, those are where you would have a cart instead of a garbage can or a garbage bag. You, you would have a cart, kind of like your green cart, but a little bit bigger. Um, and you would place all of your garbage in that cart. And an, an automated truck would come down the street. And based on where you've positioned your garbage at the curb, an arm would come down and it would grab the cart. And then it would dump it into the truck and set it back on the curb. So instead of having uh, laborers collect your garbage and throw it into the truck, um, you know, health and safety issues, all of that kind of things that happen with waste collection, uh, the garbage truck would do the brunt of the work. And Angela, uh, through the chair, would you still have to put it in garbage bags as well? 
And would so, the carts be big enough for more than one garbage bag? Yeah, through the chair. So that would be something that we would study, Councillor Pauls. Um, in Toronto, as an example, um, residents have either a small, medium, or large cart, which they choose based on how much waste they generate. Um, so we would we would look at that. Uh, when I when I think of other carts that I've seen in other municipalities, uh, some people package their garbage when they put it in the carts, because, so in a garbage bag, because then after the cart is tipped, it's not you know not too messy. Um, so kind of prepackaging the garbage, almost like you do with your green cart now. Um, putting materials in a garbage bag first is just a little bit tidier. So if that's what residents choose to do, they would be able to do that. And through the chair, last question, would that eliminate then the tags? Because you would have one cart only and uh, no need for tags to put two or, or three extra bags. Yeah, so through the chair, we haven't studied that yet. And again, so I do know from other municipalities, residents still have the ability to set out additional waste and whatever policies those municipalities have. Maybe it's a bag with tags. Maybe it's, uh, you know, you purchase something in advance. Maybe you bought, you upgrade your cart to a larger cart if uh, you find you're generating more waste than, than you normally would. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Any further discussion on this item? Not seeing any, I have a couple questions. Um, Councillor Pearson, did you have something to add? Thank you. Uh, the the West Mountain Transfer Station, um, that's going to be very welcome for uh, mountain residents. I know uh, residents in Ward 8, when we go to Upper Ottawa, it's often jam-packed and uh, you have a, a long wait. And uh, if you head down to Kenora, it's actually about the same time, but uh, just for whatever reason, it just usually doesn't occur to me to to just make the trip down to Kenora. But um, having that West Mountain transfer station, I think is is a big improvement for the service for residents on the mountain, for sure. So I really uh, appreciate seeing that in the plan. Um, I guess the, the big thing here is that we're going to provincial responsibility for Blue Box in 2025. So to make some substantial changes to the solid waste management master plan, in the in the meantime really doesn't make sense is is that more or less the um um the criteria that was that was reviewed when when this was put together that was kind of the driving factor that in 2025 everything's going to change pretty substantially yeah, through the chair. So based on those blue box transition regulations, based on our active projects that are currently going on, uh, we didn't want to add anything to the list that would be jeopardized after 2025. Thank you. And just on the on the waste diversion side, so during the uh, the biweekly garbage collection debate, a couple of the items that came up were multi residential and commercial. And I know through our work on the waste management advisory committee that uh, we we have some strategies, education, uh, outreach, and enforcement on those two items in particular. So, um, just so I'm clear, those will continue, and we're still going to work on diversion in the uh, the multi-res and commercial sectors. Absolutely, you'll see a couple of those items. One of them is uh, just you know improving current programs. So multi-res would be an example of that. Uh, something we plan on doing with multi-res, just like with single family, is increasing the number of uh, audits that we're able to do so that we can have that reliable data um, to make decisions on. And from a business perspective, in the focus groups that SNC Lavalin held, businesses were really interested in being incentivized. So, you know, I put waste in the right place or something that says, you know, I'm, I'm a green business. Um, how do we uh, work with those partners uh, so that they want to maximize their diversion opportunities as well? Thank you. And one of the things that you and I have discussed uh, previously is developing requirements for site plan when it comes to uh, waste management and being more specific about what's required for development. Um, so we just elaborate that on that on that point a little bit and when we might expect that uh, to be finalized. Yep, through you, the uh, the waste design guidelines are actually being updated right now. Uh, we'll be bringing some information to the December 2nd Waste Management Advisory Committee before it comes to Public Works Committee. And it's basically just ensuring that all new developments, whether it's an apartment building or a townhouse complex, um, develops their site so that uh, uh, residents can access the waste diversion programs on site and also that the city is able to get in and get out safely to be able to pick up the items. 
Thank you. I think that's a, a really important strategy because oftentimes you get to site plan and waste management is kind of the, you know, the last thing that we uh, that we talk about or consider. And you know, all of a sudden residents buy you know a, a condo or something like that with a waste management uh, with the with the garbage bins right beside them or something like that. So I think it's really important to spell that out in advance so that everybody, you know, as as we're going through the process, knows what the expectations are. Um, could you just give us an update on the single-use plastic strategy as well? Yeah, through you. So the single-use plastic strategy report, it should be coming to Public Works Committee in January or February. Um, we were we were ready to go. Uh, we presented some information to Waste Management Advisory Committee, as you know. And then uh, with Public Works Committees uh, coming back on the schedule after the COVID shutdown, we had a few other items that we wanted to bring forward first. So that will be coming. Um, the delay, if you will, uh, has also allowed us to follow up. As you know, the federal government has made some announcements in the last few weeks about banning uh, some plastic items in 2021. So uh, we're just updating and um, refreshing some of the action items we had in our strategy so that it can align with the new information we've received. Okay, thank you. And finally, just um, going back to the provincial takeover of the Blue Box program. So right now as a municipality, we give complimentary blue boxes to residents that request them. Has there been an indication from the province if they will continue that practice or might that be something where we could look at for potential savings in the meantime? Yeah, so what we know so far in the draft regulation is that whoever ends up being our provider of recycling collection uh, will need to provide the containers. Will it be a cart? Will it be a box? Will it be a bag? We don't know that yet. Uh, we have read in the draft that uh, replacements would also be offered uh, a couple of times a year. Okay. So at this point, um, I don't think there's, I'm going to say I don't think, uh, there's a charge for that. It is something that we have in our uh, comments back uh, just to ensure if if the uploaded program wants to encourage diversion, just like we always have, you have to ensure that the residents are set up for success. Great. Thank you. Those are all the questions I had. Uh, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Angela. Thank you again for the excellent overview. And uh, you know, it's um, this is one of the areas and one of the committees where we're, we're always following a bouncing ball because rules change and regulations change. And I, I commend staff for all the hard work and, and um, everything you do to keep us uh, up to date on, on the regulations and what we can do for the taxpayers of the city of Hamilton and to preserve our landfill site, which I understand, I'm just gonna mention, I think the life right now on our landfill currently is to 2047, Angela, is that correct? Yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, 2047. And our, I think the third cell is just being opened. So this will be the last cell that's available. Um, so Angela's just nodding her head, yes. And um, you know, for any of the viewing public, this is really, really important. This is the reason we've taken all of these initiatives for since 2000, because um, landfill is very valuable today. We would, we would be in a, a huge dilemma to have to either site another landfill or look at another option of processing our waste going forward. Um, not only would it be an EA process, but it be it could be years, tens of years, um, in doing that. So the longer we can preserve what we have um, by um, diverting. Uh, materials that we can. This is the most important process that we have available to us. But my one question, and I thank Councillor Danko for raising it with regards to multi-res, et cetera. A Angela, we, we chatted when you gave me an overview of this. One of the biggest issues I have is with, um, and, and no disrespect, but you know, multi-development. Multi so your townhouses, your condominiums, your, your um, uh, what are they called? Um, sweet some, they, they, they back back to Masonettes. Um, so the issues I have, obviously developers today, land is very expensive and they're trying to fit as much as they can on the land site, on the off site. Um, one of the problems is that unfortunately waste management becomes, it's almost an afterthought for these developers. And I've had a couple of situations where, um, you know, they, they try to eke out as much as they can. And if they can't meet the space for the trucks to get through, it now becomes the developer and the condo board's responsibility to address their own waste. 
So Angela, I know that um, you've discussed that you're working, is it's now called the West End Association, if I'm not correct. Uh, if I am correct, that um, that took that changed the name from the Hamilton Halton Home Builders Association, and I understand if you could just give an overview. Staff are working very closely with them because I believe we really have to tighten our belts on what we will and will not allow as these developments go forward. So, Angela, please. Yeah. So, through the chair, just one thing, Councillor Pearson, about the Glamrock landfill. So, we opened up Stage Three, Cell A, last year, and right now they're working on developing Stage Four. So, um, we've got a, li a little bit of space to go there. So, on uh, on that question, through the chair, yes. So, I mentioned that uh, we are bringing the design criteria through to Waste Management Advisory Committee in December. Uh, one of the updates you would hear there is that not only are we meeting with the West End Home Builders Association. Association to provide them with the information and to get their feedback. Uh, we're also attending, it's a subcommittee of council as well. I might not have the name right, but it's the development association yeah. uh, that a number of city staff sit on as well. So um, the updated guidelines are uh, nearly finished. Uh, again, municipal scan uh, definitely helped to inform any changes that other municipalities have done up to this point, as well as working with planning and economic development staff and waste management staff, um, making sure that there aren't any conflicting policies out there in the city. Uh, so yeah, that information will come, again, reaching out to all important stakeholders uh, to be able to provide the best guideline we have. What we'll see, though, is a more rigid standard uh, to ensure that from site plan review stage to people moving in and requiring their waste to be collected, that the design criteria, um, it's really important that it would be followed um, so that uh, everybody has access to the diversion programs that we offer and that uh, we're able to service those. Programs. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, certainly uh, I will follow that very closely because uh, it's most important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. Really appreciate the uh, discussion this afternoon. It was very informative. So I need a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? This is just to receive the presentation. Thank you, that's carried unanimously. And then report, I need a mover and a seconder to move the, uh, and approve the report. Moved by Councillor Pauls, seconded by Councillor Nan. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried unanimously. On to item 8.2, the public bike share program phase procurement process. I'd like to call on Peter Toplovic, project manager of sustainable mobility to present. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Peter Topolovic, program manager of sustainable mobility. I'm going to talk to you about the process. Uh, I'll first talk about background. I'll, I'll explain the hybrid phase procurement operating model. I'll talk about expansion plans and the long term plan. So, how we get we get here? I think most of us know that in 2013, we we're going to go. Metrolinx gave us a 1.5 million dollar infrastructure grant to acquire the equipment, which we purchased, and then through RFP, uh, we awarded the operating contract to Social Bells Bicycles LLC. And they subcontracted operations to Hamilton Bike Share Inc., a not for profit. Uh, over 2015, when we launched, up until 2018, uh, we had a lot of uh, membership use and successes uh, with some awards. And then we also kicked off our and expanded our Everyone Rides initiative, which was our equity program, uh, being one of Canada's first equity programs for uh, micro mobility. Uh, in 2018, uh, Social Bicycles was purchased by Jump, which is owned by Uber, and Uber renewed their operating contract uh, with the city and terminated their contract with Hamilton Bike Share Inc. And then uh, it's hard to forget the pandemic and the termination, uh, the early termination of the contract uh, that Uber had with us in the city. And at that point, through a donor support, 
we were able to turn over the operations again to Hamilton Bike Share Inc. Uh, in an emergency mode until February uh, 2021. At that time, council also directed uh, staff to um, uh, continue a procurement process for a long-term system. And that's really where we are here today uh, is to talk about the phase procurement process. So the plan moving forward, if approved by council today, uh, is to maintain the current base bike share program and the equity program, which is operated by Hamilton Bike Share Inc. through a two-year contract extension. And that's what you see here in the left panel. In the right panel, we are proposing to add a uh, commercial micro mobility permit, which will be operated by various uh, commercial operators, potentially up to three, uh, for a two-year contract. Just going to go. So, th the current base bike share program is as you see it today. The city owns the bike share equipment and stations. The system is stable and designed for reliable operations. Equity is the key operating imperative for the system, and it connects it to and supports public transit and the HSR. Uh, the benefits here is the bike share operations are maintained by Hamilton Bike Share Incorporated without the use of city funds. It provides a sustainable service. It ensures the equity program will continue, and it is, it is also provided through a grant process. Uh, and the private sector funding will be used to uh, offset or reduce the impact to operations, uh, including sponsorships and advertising, but also at Hamilton Bike Share Inc. has access to grant programs that other for-profit corporations do not. In terms of the other side of the equation here, the commercial micromobility permits, this, these, uh, this equipment will be owned by the private sector, unlike the base bike share program. Uh, the operators will be on a two-year contract. There's no requirement for stability or equity that will be handled by the base bike share program. The fees will be collected, uh, will be contributed to the base bike share operations, so, and also enforcement. And this would be to offset any impacts to the base bike share program. This allows us to also test the market to see if other devices, other micro mobility devices, um, have a role here in Hamilton and will be used by uh, citizens. Uh, this this program will be self funded through the contracts and application fees. There'll be there'll be enforcement to ensure compliance. This will uh, provide uh, offset any impacts to bike share and allows the private sector to really test the market here without compromising our bike share operations in it. Oops. Uh, then the question of e-scooters, this is brought up a lot when we talk about micromobility. Most micromobility permit programs uh, in North America are centered around privately operated commercial e-scooters. And to be clear, when we say e-scooters, we mean devices where uh, the person would stand on the e-scooter and be kick style, so that you propel it by first kicking your other foot that's on the ground. Uh, sorry, there's no picture here for that, but I think I've, I've provided the visual. This is not, this is not referred to an e-bike or, or, or a bicycle that's pro propelled by electric motor. These are specifically e-scooters. Uh, many cities in Canada and the United States have e-scooters operating alongside their base bike share systems, and the base bike share systems are generally supported by the cities. Some of them are also just testing e-scooter programs. A permit or similar process in Hamilton will allow staff to evaluate e-scooters during the first phase of the procurement to determine if they should be included in a long-term bike share procurement. So this ability for us to test and understand the market will be important as we move into the long-term plan. But the inclusion of e-scooters in this operating framework will be reviewed uh, after committee and council has had an opportunity to consider e-scooters. And this happens on, I believe, December 7th. Uh, and this report will be uh, presented to council in Q4 of 2020. And so this hybrid model that we're proposing uh, was developed through uh, the, the a report on the different uh, operating models out there in North America was developed and included as an appendix to this report. And we looked at various cities, including Washington, Arlington, Chicago, Austin, and Portland, and Indianapolis, especially because these types of cities had existing bike share programs before they also opened up their market to e-scooters or other forms of micromobility. And the important piece here is that they, they invested heavily in their base bike share programs like we're proposing. And they've also gone through phase procurement uh, in the same sense that we're proposing here today. We also looked at for guidance from the North American Bike Sharing Association that had many different resources on all types of different micromobility that we were able to use in our analysis. And all these cities, uh, 
use some types of funding to operate operate their systems, and some come to the private sector, including sponsorships and and advertising. In terms of the the expansion of the system beyond the existing service area, uh, operators uh, will be encouraged to provide additional coverage in all areas of the city that they can accommodate. Our research indicates that there are key areas that can support bike share beyond the current service area in the short term. And there's a map on the next slide that I'll show you that will highlight these areas. But expansion to these areas will be a business decision of the operator. So be, be definitely be operator dependent and operators who uh, are looking to provide that expansion will be given first priorities. So here's the map that I had referred to. And in the middle here is in that gray area, that's the existing service area that's been grayed out. And you can see once we once we do that, the analysis looking at uh, a variety of factors, including things like population density and uh, ridership of uh, active transportation and uh, bike lanes, et cetera, uh, show that the areas around Mohawk College and the Brow lands, as well as areas around Kenworth, uh, all show potential for uh, short-term expansion of, of, of micromobility in the city. In terms of the long-term plan, uh, what we're presenting here is phase one, which would happen in 2021 and 2022. This represents the first step in the process. We would continue to operate the base bike share program as I've, as I've shown above previously. Uh, we develop a long-term business plan for the bike share. Uh, we upgrade our current system. We secure long-term financing and we potentially test new technologies like I mentioned in terms of micromobility and e-scooters if, if council chooses to go in that direction. And that will set us up for a strong foundation for phase two, which would happen between 2023 and 2028, which is the, there's another longer term strategy. We report back on the progress of phase one in the second quarter of 2022 on our preferred procurement process based on our findings. We initiate the procurement process in the, at the end of 2022 to launch the new base program in the second quarter of 2023. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, the, this report recommends two main pieces. One, that we extend the contract with Hamilton Bike Share until the end of 2022 to continue operating our existing base bike share system. Uh, the reason why we're recommending this, of course, is all based on our research of other cities that have base bike share systems. Also, that we've had no uh, issues with the operations uh, between uh, the end of June and now with Hamilton Bike Share Inc. Uh, also, that Hamilton Bike Share Inc. will be able to do this with at no cost to the city. Uh, and they have access to grants that other uh, corporations would not have. And finally, that during COVID and during the financial instability at this moment, uh, it makes sense to uh, take time to do a business plan in the next two years and then launch a long-term system. The second part of the recommendations uh, are around the fee-based non-exclusive contract system for the operation of a micromobility technologies in the city right-of-way. This could be any type of uh, micromobility system operated by a for-profit uh, corporation. And the, the rest of the recommendations essentially uh, give us the ability to do so, uh, inc including that we'll come back to evaluate the results of the phase approach, approach especially in phase one, and, and to report back to council on the long-term plan with the, uh, the new procurement process in place for 2023. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I have councillors Farr, Nan, and Collins on the speaker's list. So, Councillor Farr. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate the work Peter does throughout the year. Um, uh, micro mobility, obviously, we've had these conversations in the past. It's uh, really the way to go and it's uh, uh, desirable uh, more and more. In cities like our city and others, obviously, as is shown in this report and the appendices to the report. Uh, just to put it in a nutshell, Mr. Chairman, through you to Peter, um, and you were a big part of the conversation, uh, the, the saving SOBI debate of some months ago, uh, which went through a few machinations, but eventually, thanks to some very generous people in the community, we, we did so, and you put the right uh, operator in place and what we're being asked here is to continue with that operator at no cost uh, to the taxpayer and what you heard then and what you'll probably hear again today is, is potentially and and fair enough is that initially when bike share was was promoted many years ago to the city uh, it was touted as uh, the same no cost and so uh, we're still there I think as a, as a council many on council are uh, some of us may see um, 
it is important enough to consider on a levy, but uh, at this point, and especially now with COVID, it's probably a non-starter. I think, I think it's fair uh, to, to recognize that, and I'm sure you understand that. So in the nutshell, are we welcoming e-scooters, micro-mobility managers, operators, I think you said as many as three, certainly the interest is there. Um, this is this is in a nutshell as a, you know it's it's desired number one but it also helps fund uh, bike share uh, for future as well well it gives us the funding source this is what's here that counts correct through you mr chair uh, the the uh, extension of the contract is sort of independent from the e-scooter program or the micro mobility program from our program and uh, the collected fees for the micro mobility program would just offset the impacts to bike share. Bike share would rely mostly on grants, sponsorships, and advertising would be the major chunk of the of the money they would use. And the and the micro mobility permit system would maybe augment that, but make sure there's no impact to it. Yeah, but ultimately though, and I know you you had mentioned it, and I think that's key. We're not debating e-scooters here today. That's an interesting discovery. But ultimately we have that stop gap if the other three uh, don't come to fruition fruition in terms of 100% of funding our current SOBI and current bike share, correct? Through you, Chair. That's what we're hearing here today? Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that's correct, yes. Okay, that's. I just want to yeah, make it clear, there's lots of really good information here, and, um, and it's appreciated. So I know we're not debating e-scooters today, but we've talked about it as a council in the past, and we'll obviously talk more fully about it in December, but there were some issues that were very 2018 and uh, my understanding is in other communities a lot of them have, have been taken care of with respect to some of the issues caused by e-scooters have you heard the same in your profession uh, through you mr chair uh yes uh, in terms of various micro mobility technologies including e-scooters uh, they've been operating for three or four years now in north america and many of the initial issues have been rectified through technology uh relationship with the cities uh enforcement and other policy. So it's come a long way since uh, early days. And those third party operators of these micro mobility and particularly e-scooters are all cooperating in these markets I'm reading too, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, it's very rare or, or absolutely zero to see someone come in rogue or disobey the rules. Uh, that's not happening anymore in uh, pretty much worldwide. What happened in the disruption in uh, four or five years ago is no longer uh, an option and uh, not happening anywhere that we're aware of. Through you, um, and just cut me off when I reach my five, I wanna let others have a chance to speak, uh, Mr. Chairman, but um, there, there appears to be still a strong interest in these operators to, to do micro mobility in this city. Is that still the case even with all these pandemic issues? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, there, there's uh, there's interest uh, there's interest from uh, various uh, operators to operate in Hamilton and, and in other cities, uh, mostly, especially when it comes to uh, e-scooter technologies. And and your report says Hamilton is well equipped to manage this type of hybrid system, and our licensing and bylaw enforcement division are already equipped to enforce a permit program. Uh, so you've already engaged on this with with. Uh, with bylaw and, and enforcement? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. And that's uh, more, more so the subject of the next uh, uh, the next council report where you'll get much more information on that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. All, all right, I appreciate it. And I just wanted to thank again, uh, Hamilton Bike Share Incorporated for the great job they've done. It's not been easy during uh, this time of COVID. Uh, they've been very successful, and certainly we wouldn't have the recommendations here before us. I think Peter has already established this had they not been uh, successful, and had they not proven to us here today and going forward that they can they can do this without uh, any cost uh, to the taxpayers uh, in this extended time that's being presented to us. So I appreciate it, Peter. I might have more questions. Likely not. Hopefully, this isn't uh, isn't really a great debate, and we can. Uh, continue forward and uh, I look forward to the December conversation as well during public works. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I know I went a little over. About 45 seconds over. Not much. <laughs> Councilor Nan. Thank you.
you through the chair. Um, similar comments in terms of uh, seeing bike shares correspondence come through in consideration to the item that's before us right now. Really glad to see that uh, Hamilton Bike Share Inc. was able to secure the funds to maintain their operations and be part of the recommendations that are before us right now, which is to extend or renew their contract to December 2020, 2022. Um, the key point here for me, uh, Chair Danko, is in regards to the equity program. I'm glad to see this recommendation come forward because a concern for me in our previous debate around keeping SOBI up was the ERI program, the Everybody Rides program, which secured $706,000 through an external funder to ensure that marginalized residents could maintain access to the bike share program in the form of subsidized bike share uh, passes in the form of adaptive bikes and other programming that helps enable residents um, to use the bike share program, which I think is a, is a critical success component of, of Hamilton's story here. Um, the question that I have through you to staff is just so I'm clear about the economic case for the shared micromobility micro -mobility plan that's before us. In reference to, um, I believe it was the first appendix, the detailed report there, there was a discussion in the report about the unmonetized benefits as well as the monetized benefits of moving forward with this, this plan, speaking to mobility, equity and access, road safety as being the unmonetized benefits that come from what's before us, and then the potential of $905,000 over five years. Um, through you, Peter, could you just, um, did I get that right? Is there is there anything else you can share with us as a committee in terms of that $950,000 over five years that would be a cost benefit to the city and would be income, potential income generated? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the that was the return on investment piece in the, in the report. And the idea there was to better understand the return on investment uh, by keeping the bike share, the base bike share program operating. And um, we wanted to better understand how the, you know, by making investments, whether it's uh, usually from grant money and capital, uh, can the operations have a net benefit to the city? And, and that's what that's shown. Um, in terms of a revenue generator, uh, I think that what we see is that most of the operating money would go back into supporting the operations of the, of the bike share program, but that we aren't re so reliant on uh, city city uh, dollars to fund those operations. Excellent. So the for-profit micro mobility fees would go towards potentially offsetting uh, any of the base bike share operations enforcement costs and that the bike share and other micromobility in and of itself would be a uh, revenue generation offset cost for operations as a long-term strategy moving forward. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so by, by having the permit, per, permit program, the idea is that there would be no impact to the city or the bike share operations uh, by the fees exchange, and that includes for enforcement. Excellent. Uh -huh. That way, we aren't impacting the the Everyone Rides program or the or the bike share program by by testing the e scooters or other forms of micro mobility that we might bring, depending on what council direction is uh, at, at the end of uh, or beginning of December. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Peter. That's it's thorough. I appreciate the report that's in front of us. Uh, when the time comes, I'd be more than happy to move the recommendations that are before us. I appreciate. Uh, staff coming back with the robustness of this plan and also taking care of balancing out the concerns that were expressed as we we're discussing the sustainability of SOBI in uh, in the previous iteration of the discussion. So much appreciated. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Councillor Collins. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And through you to Peter. Peter, a very comprehensive report, a lot of information. Thank you for that. A quick question on the... Um, the current state of, of SOBI through the pandemic. I know it must be a difficult uh, year for them like it is for everyone else. Do we have current stats on how they fared through the pandemic? And um, you know what, what the future might hold for them in 2021 if we use the same numbers? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we, we don't have the, I don't have the specific uh, you know, ridership stats or, or uh, dollar amounts, but from what I understand in, in our as alluded to in the letter from uh, Chelsea uh, that's sent to council, 
that while while they're operating in emergency mode, they, they have uh, had stable operations. There's stable use as well, but across across the whole continent right now, there has been about a reduction in ridership by somewhere between 20 to 50 percent. Uh, and that's common because a lot of commuters would have made use of the system, uh, all these systems, including ours. Uh, and so while ridership is down, it isn't impacting the ability to do the operations. I think that's the important part. And we're seeing consistent ridership uh, across the pandemic for people who are no longer using it. Like some are going to work, obviously, especially in healthcare, and others are using it for either recreation or uh, errand running. But Very certainly, the ones who are, the commuter shed is, is 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 a little smaller today than it was pre pandemic. Good to hear. Um, I, I had a couple of questions on the micro mobility, so it makes it a little bit um, difficult to speak to it, knowing that it is coming on a future agenda. But I, you know, I guess one of the concerns that I have, and I'm willing to keep an open mind, but you know, I I've lived with the waterfront trail and its operation since its opening back in the early 2000s, and have had um, you know on and off problems with uh, uh, people using, you know, electronic, electric devices, whether it's in a, a scooter or an e-bike on the trail, and they're currently prohibited. And this past year, Council was very supportive of putting in a, um, an ambassador program um, on the trail, and we had bylaw officers there on a daily basis throughout the summer, and it was a regular occurrence for e-bikes. I think it was once or twice a day were the stats where we caught somebody, in addition to some of the other issues that we were dealing with, but so I, I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, we're we're cognizant of those issues. Um, I had it took me, you know, a motion to council and council support to get the bylaw enforcement that we needed on the trail. And we have great stats, and I'm hoping that Ken and his staff, Ken Leanders and his staff, at some point in time, can provide an update to committee in terms of what our findings were. Um, but I, I just want to make sure that we're cognizant and going into this eyes wide open as it relates to the issues we currently deal with on our trails with other mobility type of devices. Um, the constant requests that we have for enforcement, as well as, you know, some of the issues that we have uh, as it relates to um, where the stations are located. So if you put a station for these devices next to the waterfront trail, odds are that people are going to use them in that area. So certainly nothing wrong with using Sobe bikes on the trail. That's what the trail is there for. Um, but, um, you know, micro mobility devices would be an issue. So I, I just want to make sure that when the report comes forward, we're cognizant of the enforcement aspect and certainly the locational issues and, and who has jurisdiction over where these locations um, might be um, introduced, um, whether it's in my area or anyone else's area in the city. So um, I'm not sure that there's a question there. I just wanted to raise those concerns knowing that you'll be coming back with a dual report related to the same. Yes, and through you, Mr. Chair, those considerations will be in that report. Super, thanks for that, Pete. No problem. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, and Peter, uh, thanks for your report today. Two questions. Number one is, uh, we're having similar issues on the trails of the Hamilton Conservation Authority as, as Councillor Collins just described on the waterfront trail. And uh, you know, we had correspondence even come to Council last meeting about why they're prohibited on HCA trails. And of course, the Conservation Authority does manage the waterfront trail down at Confed Park. Um, you know, the HCA has taken a position that we do support them if they're battery assisted bicycles. Um, it's come to our attention though that on the e-scooters, there's a whole smorgasbord of different scooters out there. And so when you come in with your report in, um, in December, I wonder if you could break down the different types of scooters that are available in the marketplace, right from the the ones you propel with your foot right up to ones that look like motorcycles. Um, apparently there's all kinds of them. They would help this decide what's appropriate on our trails and what is not appropriate, uh, mainly for the safety of the people walking. Can that be included in your report in December? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it along to our report writer as well, that the Ministry of Transportation is, is involved in that that piece in terms of determining which types of uh, devices can go where um, and provide clarity. From your but experience, how, how many different scooters is there out in the marketplace? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in terms of uh, both in uh, available to the marketplace in general for personal purchase, yes. versus commercial 
uh, for commercial operations, they differ a bit, but there are multiple different uh, varieties. Generally speaking, when we say e-scooters, we mean the kick style stand on top e-scooters, which have a compact form. Uh, but there are other types of scooters, so that that the, where the difference between a scooter and an e-bike sort of becomes unclear. That's not necessarily what we're dealing with with the micro mobility systems that we're talking about from a commercial standpoint. Uh, but you could have a sit on top scooter, which is different than a kick style scooter, but they're called the same name. I think that's where some of the confusion is. Um, yeah. And so I yeah. think we can provide some clarity there. You sure can, because uh, um, your definition of what a scooter is can be entirely different than somebody else who has a different one. And they all want to take them out on our trails. And some of them are simply unsafe because they go too fast and they run too quiet and, and walkers can't hear them coming up behind them. So if you can have the report writer define for us how many scooters are out there and what are they all called to help us make the right decision on what's permitted on our trails? That would be great. And the second There's question is, it, you know, there's been a lot of um, concern over the last number of years about bike share that they don't set anything aside, a few cents per ride or capital replacement. Um, is the current operator and the one that you're asking us to renew, uh, which is bike share for another two years, are they have a fund set up now for capital replacement where they take a few cents for ride and reserve it in there so when they have to replace these bikes, there's money available? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that's uh, uh, not common in, in uh, most North American systems that we, we, we did ask that question to everyone we've interviewed and collected information on. For the most part, um, the, uh, the operators certainly aren't generally the ones who do that since the, it's the equipment owners, uh, which would be the city in this case for our bike share program. But a lot of what, we, what cities have done is, is gotten uh, grants to um, replace bicycles or got new operators in to replace those bicycles. So the replacement plan is there, but not in the traditional sense as we would do with other types of vehicles. Mostly it's been through grants from uh, other levels of government or a full replacement of the fleet when a new operator comes in. Uh, and so that, that's been the strategy moving forward. And in fact, there are lots of opportunities because uh, there are many bikes like this, the Sobe bikes available to us by making uh, purchases through uh, from other cities, we can augment our fleet and upgrade our fleet uh, without needing to put aside any, um, uh, the operator needing to put aside any costs. However, at the same time, the operator has been responsible for many years to replace the parts. So most of our bikes actually have fully upgraded parts already as, as of today because of those, those, those uh, investments. So most of the investments come through parts replacement. Okay, because a lot of us have been questioning this for a long time. Why don't we set up a capital a replacement reserve like we do with fire trucks or heavy equipment or vehicles in the city? So that there's not the big hits come when you have to do a large replacement. And I'm surprised that nobody's embracing that idea because it's just good business practice to be able to have a reserve set up for when you get those big hits and have to replace 100 bikes. You don't have to turn back to us or Metrolinx to um, put up another $1.5 million to do that. Okay. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Good discussion on the uh, variation in electric vehicles, all the way from the, you know, the one wheel that I ride up to uh, electric dirt bikes and a full electric Harley. Even um, actually, one of the coolest ones I just saw was a full electric surfboard. So there's a there's a whole variation out there. Anyway, going on to Councillor Pauls. And thank you, thank you through the chair. Thank you, Peter, first of all, for taking time to talk to me offline. We had quite a conversation about uh, um, the Sobe bikes. Uh, but Councillor Ferguson actually asked a question about, because I saw your presentation about upgrade current system. And I was gonna ask the question, who pays for the upgrade? But uh, you did give the answer. So uh, um, thank you for that. And thank you to Councillor Ferguson for raising that. But I wanted to ask you uh, um, if you could just elaborate a little bit about the connection about expanding the um, Sobe bikes on the mountain. You said there's a connectivity. Can you tell me exactly where your thoughts are and how it would come? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Uh, 
what what the if I referring to the map I had showed through the presentation, uh, it does show the areas around Kenworth, Mohawk College, and the Brow lands, including concession, as the the most likely candidates for expansion. And uh, to do so for a bike share, it would involve the placement of stations and bikes. And partially, I guess I was referring to also the grants, and I, I've included those in the report that show that there is um, uh, money to purchase more bikes uh, for expansion. Uh, and that's what we would be using to both make the expansion and replace any other uh, older bikes in the in the fleet. So uh, that actually, and we've also had a grant come in for stations. So we actually have the stations already available to make expansions in different areas. On the, on the other side, the, the micro mobility operators may also wish to expand to these areas. So if, if the appetite is there, uh, we could uh, we will also be encouraging them to expand in these areas as well. And thank you. And I know that you've met with uh, some business on Concession Street, and you've been talking to uh, business that would love to have that. And um, so that's really good to know that uh, there could be some expansion. Now, I know that um, from the east to the west, uh, especially when we do San Lawrence and the Caddy Trail, there's going to be um, trails that go from one end to the other. So I can see being expanded there. But um, the last question I wanted to ask about the e-scooters, are e-scooters allowed on the road or do they have to go on, on uh, the bike lanes only? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, various jurisdictions take different approaches. Uh, the MTO has given the city the ability to decide, but generally speaking, they will go wherever bikes go. Wherever bikes go. You know, and that report, the, the, the clarity on that will come in on December the 7th as well. Okay. It will be good to know because I know there's a, a lot of uh, even beginner uh, bikers that might, you know, feel uneasy to have uh, um, a scooter behind them going double the speed and not knowing what to do. So I'm just wondering if they could go on the road or not. But if you, um, the update's gonna come in December, that will be great to know. So thank you, Peter. And thank you again for taking time to talk to me. Thank you. To the chair, thank you. Thank you, okay. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Peter. Thank you for all of the information. Um, I uh, appreciate certainly uh, Councillor Ferguson's comments and, and um, valid points. Um, it's, it would be a good suggestion that they, they look at um, a reserve going forward for upgrading and purchasing new, new cycles. Um, but my question, uh, again, with regards to the trails, and I appreciate Councillor Collins raised this concern as I'm sure he has the major, the, the crux of the issues in his ward. Um, but I received a number of emails from seniors with regards to the e-bikes, and I, these are the electric, not the scooters that you push with one foot. Um, and I just wanna leave it with you as a thought because the comments that I've received were, could we have different regulations for different age groups? And I don't know how we would do that. That would be the most difficult. But I'm just thinking if I could leave that with you in your report coming in December, so you have some context of what we're getting as counselors, because um, I've, I've, I've heard from a number of residents in my wards who, who in my ward who are seniors have purchased these these bikes so that they could ride the trail. Um, and now they can't because uh, they're motorized. So I just want to leave that thought with you as possibly something to look at and put in your report when you come forward in December. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any further discussion on this item? Not seeing any. So to receive the presentation, have moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Farr. All in favor to receive the presentation. Okay, I think we got everybody that carried and then on the report. And to approve the recommendations, moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor. Just waiting for eScribe.
and that passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Good discussion. On item nine, 9.1 is the road safety review and appropriate measures at the York, Boulevard, York Road and Newman Road intersection in Ward 13. And uh, the mover and seconder to put this on the floor. And Councillor Vanderbeek, I'm not sure if you uh, put you on. You're okay. All right. So moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Jackson. Any discussion on item 9.1? Councillor Vanderbeek. You're still muted. You have to unmute. I'm yeah. unmuted now. <laughs> I was looking for the I was looking for the circle thing to unmute. I thought you like move your mouse around. Well, where is it? <laughs> no, it's like I was hoping I could find it in the other way. But anyway, <laughs> I found it. I'm on. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I I would like to speak to um, to item number nine point one. I uh, have several concerns about this and I've had several recent inquiries from constituents. So I would appreciate the opportunity to work a little further with staff to address in more depth some of the answers to the questions and the impacts on um, a particularly on a pending Niagara Scarpment Plan amendment application that has been that is underway. I am um, in that regard I would like to move uh, a deferral so moved by myself and seconded to Councillor Jackson by Councillor Jackson that report PW20071 and PW20196 respecting road safety review and appropriate measures at the York Road and Newman Road intersection be deferred to a future public works committee meeting to allow staff the opportunity to meet with the ward councillor and review their concerns. Okay. So the deferral is on the floor, moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor Jackson, um, to defer this to a future public works meeting. Just looking to clerks, Alicia, do we have to specify a date or is a future meeting sufficient? Future meeting is sufficient. Okay, any discussion on the deferral? Councillor Pearson. My only question, and thank you, Councillor Vanderbeek, I certainly do support your request, but I understand the MTO initiated this um, this review. So just through to staff, is there any implication on timelines, um, recognizing this coming back sooner than later, but um, is there any issue that we have with the MTO? I can take that, Councillor Danko. Thank you. Uh, through, through Chair Danko to uh, Councillor Pearson. Um, this was actually um, uh, an outstanding uh, business list item. We were directed back in 2019 as part of a planning application to undertake a number of tasks, including a road safety review. Um, so we felt obligated, uh, given the time that has passed, uh, to bring this report forward. Uh, we, however, continue to uh, share information uh, with the Ministry of Transportation and vice versa. Uh, and in my opinion, there's nothing time sensitive uh, that would be caused by a deferral of this, this report. That's wonderful. I'm most, most supportive and appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, not seeing any. So all in favor of deferral? Thank you, that passes unanimously. On to 9.2, the Hamilton Water Main Fire Flow Requirement Design Guidelines. I need a mover and seconder to put this on the floor. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. Is there any discussion on this item? Not seeing any. Um, Chris, Councillor Ferguson. Are you still muted, Councillor? find that on mute button. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, is, is Mark Brainbridge on the line? If not, maybe Andrew could answer the question next. I saw Andrew on. Andrew. Um, Mark is on the line. Oh, Mark is on the line. Mark, I know we were, I was used to get a lot of complaints about this and how long it would take to get the fire um, rating capacity in an area, particularly in the Ancaster Industrial Park. Does this new system make it faster now? I think I read that in the report. 
And if so, what are we doing differently? Good afternoon, uh, through the chair. It's Mark Bainbridge, the Director of Planning and Capital for Hamilton Water. Uh, Councillor, uh, that's a good question. We we certainly have heard the uh, industry in past years that were uh, concerned about the timelines. Um, when we implemented the pilot process uh, about one year ago, uh, we changed the formula for the evaluation of fire flows across the city to uh, reflect a formula that is largely based on an Ontario building code platform, um, from the fire underwriters survey platform um, that we use. To use. Um, as a result of the calculations, the formulas, we also implemented a, um, a standard set of criteria for different types of installations that show directly a fire flow value. So we've moved from what was a fairly complicated um, process to one that's very much more simple and it has reduced the uh, the number of turnarounds and the timelines for which applications are uh, uh, and, and revisions to the applications have been made. Okay, Mark, thanks for that. And I uh, appreciate you dealing with that problem. It always puzzled me how the Ancaster Industrial Park, which is really a new park, had to have a water capacity rating done for every new building that went up in there. And it sounds like this will streamline it quite a bit. So thanks very much. That's all I got. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Farr. Quick, quick question from Mark on Appendix B, page 2 of 17. Uh, it's a Q&A section, and it says, Mark, through you, is there a hotspot mapping uh, for areas of low available fire flow? And the answer is no formal mapping is currently available for distribution, but could potentially be prepared and provided in the future. Um, to that, I would be very interested. This is a this is a hot issue um, in Ward Two, and it seems to be hotter in some areas than others. Um, so, through you to Mark, is this something that you might be able to put together? Then it looks like you've referenced that that's possible. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, definitely. We have uh, collect we have data and information. Uh, from fire hydrant testing. Um, we know that the downtown area where we have older systems in place um, tend to uh, have uh, more concerns than brand new systems. Uh, so that is definitely something we can put together and we are in fact moving in that direction with collection of information. Um, and you know we can look at that more seriously in terms of um, presenting that data in a different way and, and make it more available uh, and, and in a nice, easily referenceable form. Um, so if that's the, if that's a request, um, we can certainly, uh, we can certainly work in that direction. It, it is definitely possible to do that. Thanks, thanks Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thanks. I might talk to Mark or, or someone or both uh, uh, responsible for this report offline and maybe uh, just try to grab something exclusive for Ward 2 if this is not of interest to anyone else because oftentimes when uh, folks are pitching developments and I, you know, and there have been four times in my office with, you know, the director of planning or the managers or, or even planners or whatever the proponent uh, who's kicking tires um, and I'm facilitating this conversation, to have something like that at the ready, you always want to share potential um, eventualities that they should understand in the early going. And here's one that I probably have never seen. Um, other infrastructure, you do try to bring that up, but something like this, uh, I think would be important, particularly because as Mark mentioned, we're dealing with a lot of older older uh, facilities here. So I'll, I'll deal with it offline. It's good to know, I'm, and, and I appreciate this report as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion? Not seeing any, so the recommendations in the report moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All in favor. Thank you. That's carried unanimously. I'm trying to flip my page without licking my fingers here. It's like you know, you're at the grocery store and trying to get those little plastic bags open. Anyway, uh, 9.3 is the universal concession fare policy. Um, 
I need a mover and a seconder to put this on the floor. Moved by anybody? Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Farr. Discussion on item 9.3. Not seeing any from committee. Okay, we'll go straight to a vote. All in favor? Councillor Nan, have you voted? There we go. Pass unanimously, thank you. Nine four cross boundary connection with Niagara Regional Transit. Need a mover and a seconder to put this on the floor. So moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by, anyway, I'll second that myself. Any discussion on 9.4? Councillor Pearson. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I can't get into the paragraph yet because it's it's telling me it's trying to put the vote up. Um, but anyways, yes, I appreciate the information. I'm just wondering, sorry, it just came up now. No, it didn't, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering if staff can, if staff is in attendance, it can give just a quick overview because this is a good news story um, as far as service from the Niagara end with um, connections and it's using some of the lands at the, um, the Costco Center. So if someone's there to just give an update, I'd really appreciate it for our committee's uh, um, indulge and information and indulgence. Thank you. Go ahead, Debbie. Uh, thank you, uh, Debbie Dalvadove, Director of Transit. Uh, so uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor Pearson, uh, yes, it is a good news story. So Ni Niagara Region um, is launching a uh, pilot, uh, micro transit pilot starting, uh, it started uh, this month until January of 2021. And through their initial uh, outreach, uh, as they were uh, designing their pilot, uh, it was identified by uh, the residents that they would like some connectivity into the city of Hamilton, uh, more specifically to Winona Crossing. So they uh, approached us um, and we've been working with them as they've developed their pilot. And we are before council today with this report as a requirement under the Municipal Services Act requires that we have council approval to allow another transit agency to bring or operate their services within our, our boundaries. So it is again a pilot that they're doing. Uh, it will be at Winona Crossing. And uh, we look forward to that connectivity with our neighbors to the east, west. I'm, <laughs> I get all east. confused with the lake there. East. East. <laughs> I'll get it, I'll get it. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing the quick overview. Um, and I appreciate, I think it's great news, but my next question is going to be, because obviously we're gonna have people, if, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that their intent is not just to access Costco, because personally, I don't know that I've ever gone to Costco because I could carry what I bought there in a shopping bag and put it on a bus. So <laughs> leave that at that. Um, so just through you, Mr. Chairman, to Debbie, Din, we, we have talked about and we are reviewing the in, improvement and enhancements of transit in the Winona area. And I'm wondering if this actually will give us um, a good indication of people coming in, because right now only TransCab would be available, but, they, but any residents coming from the Niagara side would not have um, the privilege of using TransCab because they would not be an HSR user. So um, Debbie, could you just maybe highlight where are we with regards to potentially uh, expanding some service into possibly to, to the, at least Winona Road with Costco? Um, through the chair, I'm going to ask Jason Vanderheide, who's also on this call to uh, provide you some uh, details on uh, where we are with that counselor. Over Thank to you, Jason. Uh, through the chair, uh, Jason Vanderheide, manager of transit uh, planning and infrastructure with the city of Hamilton. Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, so what this essentially provides is a connection uh, between our existing TransCab service uh, for those folks who want to continue their journey in either direction, either from Winona into Hamilton or from 
Hamilton into Winona. It also provides the opportunity for Winona residents to uh, access or cross the boundary to access the services provided at Winona Crossing. In terms of expanding uh, our conventional service, um, because TransCab, as you know, is a an extension of our con conventional service, uh, in terms of expanding our conventional service all the way out to Winona Crossing, that is something that uh, we are uh, keenly aware that there is a uh, a desire, if you will, and and um, there is a gap of conventional service from um, Jones Great Road, road. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jones Road East yeah. to uh, to Winona Road. So that is something that uh, through the remainder of the ten year strategy, we would be looking at uh, uh -huh. how we could um, uh, foster services out there, and then also through our re envision campaign, uh, we did hear um, from the community out there that there is a, a desire for um, improved transit uh, in that area. So that is something uh, as we work through the re envision campaign, we will be looking at uh, solutions for um, that area of the city. Wonderful, and I thank you for that, and I appreciate the overview. Um, certainly for our committee and for the viewing public, because I'm, I'm getting numerous emails uh, with regards to requests for upgrading and extending service, not just from Jones Road, but also to on the north side of the QEW. And I know I've met with staff. I know just after the election, we did take one of our new shorter buses out there and, and do a you know, a, a test route and it's possible. It's just obviously funding. So I appreciate what staff have said and I'm hoping that, and unfortunately COVID certainly put another wrench in the whole process, but I'm hoping that um, we can put something in place sooner than later. So thank you for that. But really I'm thrilled to see this um, this Niagara um, uh, enhancement that, that may will help us to see where people are coming from as well. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. So moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by myself. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. This is unanimously 9.5 is the Waste Free Ontario Act proposed regulation to amend the Blue Box program. I need a mover and a seconder to put it on the floor. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Nan. Any discussion on 9.5? Councillor Ferguson. You're still muted, Councillor. There, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. So on page two of the report, there's a matrix there showing the blue box program costs. So um, I'm just trying to see who the author of the report is. Rafaela or Craig, I guess. I'll ask the question to Craig and he can deflect it to the right person. Estimated revenues is $2 million. Is that the revenue you get from the sale of the recycled product, like all your fibers and cardboard paper and cans and bottles and all that stuff? Is is it, are we only getting two million dollars now to sell that product? Uh, Craig Murdoch, Director of Environmental Services, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that is correct. The market is not healthy as we've communicated it in the past, and we've gone from a high of about six million dollars probably four years ago, if memory serves, as a revenue, and ever since the um, the markets in foreign countries were refusing their um, importation of materials, the market has collapsed. Yeah, I knew that uh, it had gone down uh, just before the last election. I thought it was a six million. I thought I heard last year it was a five million. Now you're forecasting out to 2023 to be down to two. What do you think it will be for 2020? The estimated revenues. Through you, Mr. Chair, I would have to get back to you on that. I was told that we were holding pretty well at our budget, which was a little above $2 million. It could have been around 2.5. Yeah, I thought it was around three. It just, is there no new interest in these recyclable materials? I know China was a problem a number of years ago, but there isn't a pickup yet on particularly a newspaper and cardboard in cans. 
Through you, Mr. Chair, the usage of cans and newspaper is on the decline. Um, plastics have been increasing for the containers that used to for substances that used to be held in cans, and newsprint, as everybody knows, is on the decline. So. Um, what we're hoping and we are seeing the starts of is that plastic markets are for containers are starting to um, recover a little bit because of interest in building new facilities in the U.S. So we could be seeing that processing facilities will be coming online in North America, where for, uh, formerly they were offshore. So um, if this will then allow people to process their own materials within our own shores, and that means any contamination, which was the driving force behind foreign markets refusing the materials, contaminations will stay on our own shores. Well, it's a good thing we're turning this over to the province in 2025, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Rhetorical question, but yes. Any further speakers? Seeing none? Okay, so on the recommendation in the report moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Nan. All in favor. Good. Carries unanimously. Thank you. On to motions, item 10.1 is the Kenilworth Traffic Circle Bellagio water feature and beautification. Councilor Marula, may you uh, introduce your motion? You're still muted. One more go. All right, I just gotta get back to my motion now. So, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Collins, and the motion <coughs> is as follows. Uh, whereas there is an interest from Ward 4 residents to enhance the Kenilworth traffic circle to allow for the potential installation of a water feature and additional floral planting beds to beautify the roadway, whereas floral beautification and design elements in the road allowance is appreciated by residents and visitors to the city of Hamilton, whereas a preliminary design concept is required to understand the servicing requirements and to develop a cost estimate for a water feature and planting bed, and whereas there is currently no funding for the proposed enhancements, therefore be it resolved, the staff engage a consultant to develop a conceptual plan and cost estimate for the construction of a water feature and additional floral planting beds in the Kenilworth traffic circle with a capital cost of 25,000 to be funded from the Ward 4 Special Capital Reinvestment Reserve Account B, that any funds remaining in the project after the Kenilworth traffic circle water feature and beautification study is completed, be returned to the Ward 4 Special Capital Reinvestment Reserve Account and C, that the mayor and city clerk be authorized and directed to execute any required agreements and auxiliary documents with such terms and conditions in a form satisfactory to uh, the city solicitor. And uh, just quickly, um, this is a gateway from, from the mountain, uh, Ward 6 to, to Ward 4. Um, it, Kenilworth Avenue was the main a main and the main artery from the industrial core to the mountain for, for decades. Um, as many of you know, we've gone from it being a, a very vibrant highway to it being a neighborhood now. And with that, the addition of the, the Kenilworth stairs that has access to the mountain, as well as the, the uh, mountain climber program for cyclists and the walkability of that area. It's now a street that is very welcoming, but more importantly, it's probably one of the most, um, active areas in the city. When you look at how many people it actually attracts on a daily basis, we're talking about thousands of people that actually travel up those kind of stairs. And we've actually installed a water fountain there as well for water to drink, dogs as well. And those thousands of people that are traveling those stairs are going to have a beautiful uh, project to look at 
when they can barely breathe at the end of those stairs when they're running up and down them. So this is an added feature not only to the neighborhood, but the city. I look forward to the completion of it. And this is one step towards that occurring. And I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. And further? actually, can I have Councillor Jackson second that rather than Councillor Collins, since it is a it is a partnership between Count Ward 6 and, and 4. Very good. Okay, any further discussion? I'm not seeing any, so moved by Councillor Marula, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All in favor. We, it, too bad we can't have a person third it like Councillor Collins since he worked on so many of those projects as well. But you third it in spirit. <laughs> Councilor Marula, don't forget to vote. Yeah, it's in. <laughs> Thank you. Just waiting for the tally. Okay, thank you. That's carried unanimously. Thank you. On to 10.2, the Liskar Park Bocce Courts and Liskar Park Clubhouse Washing Facility Security Enhancements. Councillor Jackson, would you introduce your motion? Thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, moved by myself, and this time on behalf of Councillor Marul and I, I will include the hardworking, industrious Ward 5 Councillor Chad Collins, seconding my motion. Where is the City of Hamilton as the owner of the lands and buildings located at Liscar Park, municipally known as 95 Carson Drive, and which property includes the Liscar Bocce Courts and the Clubhouse Washroom Facilities of Liscar Park, here, here and after collectively referred to as simply Liscar Park? Where is, Mr. Chairman, the City's committed to providing safe and inclusive spaces for all residents to enjoy, enjoy rec activities within their neighbourhoods by implementing measures that mitigate risks associated with vandalism and other security breaches. Whereas, Mr. Chairman, several initiatives are currently in progress consistent with City Council's July 2020 approval of a certain public works report where, whereby staff committed to creating a park security committee in quarter three of this year that will identify all applicable park properties and categorize each property as a regular site or a high priority property based on recent activities and unfortunate criminal behaviors past three years, and whereby a two-year pilot park security patrol program is set to commence in the spring of next year, and whereas there's been an increasing number, unfortunately, of repeated vandalism and security incidents over the past several years at Liskar Park, including three separate break and enter incidents in 2020, my editorial by a bunch of cowards, Mr. Chairman, and such incidents undeniably have caused erosion of the public trust and confidence in the safety of Liskar Park facilities. And whereas since 2018, over $6,000 has been spent on simply repairs, graffiti and damages directly related to this vandalism. And whereas finally, the city wishes to proactively address the safety concerns of the community at Liskar Park as well as to mitigate future risks of repeated vandalism. Therefore, be it resolved, A, that in, in advance of the start of the Park Security Patrol Program of next year, staff designate Liskar Park as a high priority for implementation of proactive security measures so as to mitigate further risks of destructive behaviors at this park. B, that the Corporate Security Office, managed by Martin Dambo, and staff and parks division managed by Carabun work collaboratively to procure and install security enhancement measures at Liscar Park, including, but not limited to, CCTV cameras, intrusion detective devices, enhanced lighting, signage, fencing, horticultural related sightline mitigation, and any other security measure as may be deemed appropriate by corporate security specialist Dan Bao, working collaboratively with manager Bun. C, that the funding for the security enhancement measures at Liscar Park, estimated at 20,000 plus or minus 10% contingency, be funded from my Ward 6 Special Capital Reinvestment Discretionary Fund and the operating impact of capital investment 
at a mere $150, $150 annually for monitoring these costs be appropriated to the operating account of the department. And D, that Mayor Eisenberger, City Clerk Holland be authorized and directed to execute any required agreements and ancillary documents and conditions satisfactory to City Solicitor Ati. Mr. Chairman, um, I just want to say that I'm grateful for the work in advance of this motion that uh, Director Rome D'Angelo and his staff, uh, Manager Duarte, and again, Specialist uh, Manager Dambo, helped with the uh, language of this motion and working collaboratively with my office, along with Superintendent Rob Wagner of Parks and Manager Kara Bunn of uh, Parks uh, Division as well. I, uh, I was hoping this obviously is a necessity because of unfortunate um, near-do-wells that for whatever reason uh, wish to damage taxpayer-funded public spaces. And I've got a group of retirees, about 60, 70 strong, that uh, of Italian, Portuguese background primarily, not exclusively, that love using the bocce courts. And unfortunately now, um, in light of their demographic, their age, and in light of these incidents, these past six months repeatedly have grown um, uh, unsure and uncertain of even venturing over to the park during the pandemic when they should be at least enjoying as much outdoor space as they can. The president, uh, Peter Cochiera, contacted me, the parks, um, the parks um, uh, president of the um, of the former uh, park committee uh, contacted me, asking me if uh, security measures could be um, could be reviewed and hopefully implemented sooner than the pilot program that's starting early next year. And uh, Mr. Chairman, that's why this motion is here before you in committee. And might I say, about four years ago, Councillor Marula advocated for CCTV cameras to be used in any park as a pilot across the city. Um, it was his idea. I immediately put up my hand because at Fay Park in the Huntington neighborhood, a number of the residents along Kingsley Drive and their backyard fences were regularly sadly being tagged. There was graffiti on the play, play structure. There was vandalism in Fay Park. I'm happy to report through funding through my Ward 6 Reserve and taking advantage of that pilot at Fay Park, I'm happy to report, and bylaw has uh, affirmed the statistical side of it, that any form of graffiti and vandalism because of the CCTV cameras has been mitigated and eliminated, to my knowledge, over these last four years. I similarly um, funded security cameras above the Huntington Park Rec Center after the $1.5 million renovation of a couple of years ago again, because of unfortunate vandalism by a few in the community who just unfortunately don't care about public assets. So based on those models, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure once installed and implemented, and if supported by committee and council, I'm sure at Liscar Park, the safety, security, and enjoyment again of this park without worry can be returned. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, seconded by Councillor Collins. Thank you, Councillor. Any discussion on the motion that's on the floor? Not seeing any. Okay, so moved by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Oh, she's already got the vote ready to go. Thank you, that carries unanimously. On to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion? Uh, not seeing any. General information, you have the uh, outstanding business list there. I need a mover and a seconder to approve the amendments to the outstanding business list. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Pauls. Any discussion on the outstanding business list? Not seeing any, all in favor? Oh, we're, we're, we're spinning here. <laughs> more, more specifically, eScribe is spinning. 
so close. Thank you. So that we're going to have to count some mail-in votes after the meeting. Councillors Marula, Pauls, and Ferguson. If yeah. Thank you. Passes unanimously. And finally, adjournment. Mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All in favor. Don't forget, you still got to vote. <laughs> so close. There we go. It's like Nevada here. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, who voted against? <laughs> Take care.